The Tom Woods Show, episode 2319. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, believing that the end of the world might be a bad thing that we should try to avoid is not a Russian talking point. But if we are going to avoid World War III, it's important for Americans to understand what's been left out of the CIA's narrative about Russia and Ukraine. Coming to the rescue here is my brand new free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Ukraine. Pick it up at wrongaboutukraine.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I am delighted to be joined by Sarah Thompson, whom I've known for some time. She's in a number of my memberships. She is a professional practicing homeopath living in coastal Maine, very much part of the liberty movement and world. I have never in 2,319 episodes, to my recollection, I have never spoken with a homeopath before, and I'm kind of agnostic about it. I don't take any hard position on it either way, but I am a believer in letting people of goodwill with plausible things to say, say them. And when I say that, I mean, as long as they're within a reasonable range, I don't consider the writers for Jacobin Magazine to be plausible, so they're not going to be invited on the Tom Woods show. But I do think that different ways of approaching medicine are or very much ought to be at least on the table. You get several different perspectives, and then you can decide what works best for you. So, Sarah, welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. I promise not to bring any Jacobins into the conversation. (laughs) That's good. That's I knew I could rely on you for that. (laughs) So, first of all, let's start with the obvious. There are going to be a lot of people, maybe not a lot, but let's say a substantial minority of listeners, who, when they hear the word homeopath, are going to roll their eyes. And that certainly would have been me even as recently as a few years ago, now I feel like there are no existing orthodoxies I am unprepared to challenge. So I am prepared to listen. Where do you think this comes from? I mean, I suppose if I were to ask a practitioner of allopathic medicine, he would say, well, look, there's no serious studies. We have no data to point to. It's all anecdotal. It's all placebo, whatever. They're going to say something like that. What's your elevator pitch in favor of your unorthodox position? Sure. Well, I mean, I would start with my story really was the most powerful piece of the puzzle to begin with, which was that I was 33 years old and I had a four-year-old and eight-month-old and I reached across the dining room table and I told my husband, I promise you I won't die. And I checked myself into the hospital with a diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia. I had to sign a release that said that the treatment might leave me infertile, which it did. And I went through, over the course of keeping that promise, four years of extensive inpatient chemotherapy. I went through bone marrow transplant. I had a liver failure. I, at one point, weighed 94 pounds and could barely walk to the end of my driveway. And then, thanks to homeopathy, after all of that, Nine years later, I am in the best health of my life. I'm on no medications. I feel terrific. So first, there is that just testament and testimony to the power of this modality. But homeopathy is a system of medicine just like any other system of medicine that has a complete theory, just like Chinese medicine or Indian Ayurvedic medicine It's been around for about 200 years. It was started by a German physician who was empirically studying the literature of medicine because he had become so appalled by the actual practice of medicine in those days. And he really discovered that you could heal people in this gentle way where you didn't have to abuse them. And that was so popular that the medical doctors at the time were very, very angry because they were losing a lot of money to the homeopaths. And there has been this ongoing antagonism ever since, really. And then it can be a hard thing sometimes to get your head around because the quantities of the actual medicine are so small, and that seems so different from what we have been taught to think of as medicine. But there are meta-studies that clearly show, including one that was used by the Swiss government to justify the continued use of 
homeopathy in their public health, which I know is not our favorite thing here at the Tom Woods show, but it is important to say that it even got past the bureaucrats that time. And also that pharmaceutical companies are using formulations created from medicines that are prepared in this super diluted and highly agitated way. They're patenting drugs that they are creating that way. So they do know that it works. They just don't like that there is this cheap and accessible way to use it without patenting it. How do you define homeopathy? Well, homeopathy is the study of similars. It's similar suffering is what it means. So we take a full case. When you see a homeopath, you get a very deep and complete intake. The initial intake can be up to two hours and learn really the full case and then match to that case a homeopathically prepared, what's called a remedy, that has a similar profile of symptoms in what we call approving, which is the way that we do the research to determine what the symptoms are that the remedy would cause. And you match those two together and it stimulates the body's own healing process to come online and overcome that level of either organic pathology or functional disease that is a state that it has gotten stuck in. If I were a practitioner of traditional medicine, the kind that you would encounter if you, I don't know, just went down to your local doctor's office and you reported a series of common symptoms to me, I would be likely to dispense to you the same medication that the doctor farther down the street would dispense to you. But is the same thing true in homeopathy, where it's all the same remedies with just a bunch of practitioners, or do different practitioners emphasize different types of remedies? The remedies are standardized. The manufacture of homeopathic remedies in the U.S. is subject to FDA oversight. The homeopathic pharmacopoeia of the U.S. is subject to that FDA oversight. So the remedies are all standardized, and they all have specific and clearly defined profiles for the symptoms they match. The subtlety is the practitioner's ability to truly understand what exactly is the symptom picture that's being presented because a lot of symptoms look the same and you have to look for the characteristic qualities. So if you have the exact same case, practitioner to practitioner, the remedy would be exactly the same. But there is a level of interpretation that is involved, and that's where the expertise in understanding the case and in understanding the remedy comes into play. So I mentioned at the beginning that, and you mentioned, you were talking about, was it Sweden? Switzerland. Switzerland, I, I beg your pardon. I was saying at the beginning that what we would be likely to hear from somebody, again, at the local hospital, would be, there's just no research backing up what you're doing. And now that I'm having you on, I'm thinking, I've had this friend for a long time, Robert Scott Bell, and he's, I think, pretty much in your camp. And I have been meaning to get him on the Tom Woods show, and I should have done that now that I think about <laughs> it much, much, much sooner than now. And I was going to ask, I remember thinking, as soon as I get Robert Scott Bell on, I'm going to ask him to confront that question about medical research supporting homeopathic remedies. And I know you've said a little bit about that, but I think this is the real hurdle and obstacle for most people is they think this is like a bunch of home remedies that your grandmother cooked up and they don't take it seriously. Well, yes, and that's not true. I mean, that's one of the things there is some confusion. Homeopathy is a very specific form of practice. Homeopathic remedies are formulated in a very specific way. And there is a lot of research about homeopathy. What there isn't a lot of are large studies because studies are expensive to fund and homeopathic remedies are $8 a piece and can't be patented. And so there isn't a lot of money in doing that type of research. Where we see more research is in these large meta studies that are looking at overall quality of life and improvement over multiple different conditions. So like the Swiss study was a meta study of different studies of people being in individualized care. So not all being treated for the same thing. 
not all being treated the same way, demonstrating the efficacy of homeopathy in general, as opposed to a specific remedy for a specific problem. Now, there are also situations where smaller studies that have been practically applied, for instance, plastic surgeons doing rhinoplasty did a study to determine if patients going through plastic surgery were recovering faster after using homeopathy in recovery. They determined that, yes, that they were. And so because it's so safe, they can just say, okay, use Arnica after plastic surgery. There's no downside. There is zero risk. And we have seen that this helps. So that is the way that it tends to get applied in studies is where it is, because it's so demonstrably safe, if it clearly helps, then it gets put into practice. So, well, let me ask you this. If I have the common cold, I wouldn't go to a doctor. I would just know that in a number of days, it'll just pass on its own. But some people will tell me I should take cold medicine to moderate the symptoms. Or for example, let's say I have a fever. And let's say it's not 105 fever, so it's at some crazy emergency level, but it's a moderate fever and I have various symptoms. There are people who say I should take medicines for this, again, to moderate the symptoms. And my feeling is, number one, I know that the fever is actually performing a function for my body. But secondly, I feel like I can kind of muddle through this and I feel like sometimes the only symptom I really would want to suppress would be if my persistent cough is keeping me from getting regenerative sleep, then it's being counterproductive. It's not helping me. I need the sleep in order to recover. I could see taking a cough suppressant because I would weigh the costs and benefits and say, being able to get a good night's sleep is what I really need most urgently. But if I had the common cold, what would you recommend I do? Would you actually say, here is a remedy? Or would you say, there's no need to stuff your body full of medicines for the common cold. Just you'll be over it in four or five days. Sure. Well, I love that you use the language of suppression because that is the difference between homeopathic treatment and other kinds of treatments. When you use a homeopathic remedy, you are supporting your body to heal through the cold as rapidly and gently as possible. So it does not force anything down into your system. It can allow a fever to spike sharply and then drop off quickly. It can allow a discharge to move through quickly. It can allow a cough to resolve quickly. And sometimes you would not necessarily go to a situation where I might not use a remedy if someone was dealing with the common cold would be if they were in treatment for a deeper chronic where it was clear that more superficial acute situation was part of the healing process. But if you just get a bug, the homeopathic remedy actually helps your body integrate that healing process more rapidly. And so, yes, absolutely. I would support that process and encourage the use of homeopathy in order to get that good sleep, in order to get that healing moving forward. If I take zinc drops yeah. because I feel the very, very beginnings of a cold coming on, would that be considered a homeopathic remedy? Nope, that would be considered a mineral supplement. But there are homeopathic remedies made from all those same substances. So there could be a situation where homeopathic zinc would be indicated by your symptoms. And it might not be the same situation. Well, now here's what I wonder about. With the medicines that I see advertised on television, the list of side effects is, you know, at this point, it's a public joke that they have all these side effects. We've become numb to them. And I generally don't get these side effects. I haven't taken any kind of novel medication in quite some time, but I've never had a problem with that. But when I listen to some of these ads, I think, I think I'll just take my chances with my original condition rather <laughs> than do this. So the worst that could happen with that kind of medicine is that I have a really bad side effect. The best thing that could happen is that the promises they make are actually kept and my health is restored. Now, when it comes to what you recommend, it doesn't seem like there's a huge prospect for severe side effects, that the worst that could happen in this case is, for whatever reason, it didn't work for me. Right. I mean, 
That is the wonderful thing. When we look at what they call side effects in conventional pharmaceutical medicine, from the perspective of a homeopath, those things are just all the effects of the medicine. Some of them you want and some of them you don't. And you don't know which ones from that medicine you're going to get in your unique body. Whereas in homeopathy, we also are always looking at all of the effects and we are matching that to the state that's being presented by the client. And the best thing that happens is that all of your symptoms just resolve easily and rapidly. And the worst case scenario really is that nothing happens at all, but there's no danger to these substances because of the way they're prepared, because of the process that they go through. Everybody, a quick message from Converso. I use the Converso app for privacy because I care about privacy and because other messaging apps that tell you they're all about privacy look like the NSA next to Converso. With Converso, you've got end-to-end -end encryption, no storage of messages on the server, no user or metadata. And it's not just you and me. Huge percentages of Americans are saying they're concerned with their lack of privacy and data security. They're fed up with being tracked online. They distrust big tech. They think they influence politics, uh, you think. And they think their phone's listening in on them. They believe their texts and calls are not secure. Converso solves it all. Full of great features like sensors off, completely deactivates your phone's camera and microphone for ultimate privacy. Self-destructing messages are automatically deleted from the recipient's device after a specified time. You can prevent screenshots from being taken. It's a fantastic app. As I say, I'm already using it, and I'm going to start using it with one of my super elite private groups. So be like Woods and go over to conversoapp.com and grab it. That's conversoapp.com. Is your opinion, and I guess the opinion of homeopaths in general, that health is a very individual kind of thing that needs to be tailored to individual circumstances? Or is it that there are general principles that should apply to everybody or those compatible with each other? And I ask that because I can think of people who say, yeah, I tried taking X or Y as a homeopath recommended and it didn't do anything for me. And I have other people who say, like you, say, my health was completely transformed by this. How do we account for this diversity of experience? Yeah. Well, I do think it's both. I mean, one of the things that is true of homeopathy, which is not true in general of conventional medicine, is that we have a very clear understanding of what it is that we are trying to achieve in the state of health which for me involves ease and adaptability of the organism, what the Hahnemann, who discovered homeopathy, called the ruling with unbounded sway of the vital force, the full vitality of the organism. That's what we're going for, you know, to be firing on all cylinders. Now, to get there is a unique path for each individual and the order of operations in which things need to happen, the unique susceptibilities of the person, the environmental circumstances of the person. Are they in a situation where there's something that's limiting their health? Are they on a medication that needs to be worked around? Is there an underlying condition that needs to be addressed first before these next layer of symptoms can be taken care of? So there are four basic principles in homeopathic treatment. There's the totality of symptoms, everything that needs to be cured, everything that is the deviation from the state of health. There is the individuality of the unique case as you take it. There is the matching of the correct remedy. And then there is giving the minimum effective dose as opposed to the maximum tolerated dose, which is more of the conventional approach. We are looking to give as little as possible to stimulate the body to bring its healing online to 100%. Is there a difference between homeopathic and holistic? Yes. So homeopathic medicine is holistic, but not all holistic medicine is homeopathic. Okay, I thought holistic, it was something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are lots of other kinds of practices that also consider the whole picture of health and disease in the individual. But in terms of a coherent healing system, with central principles to which we 
adhere as we are navigating the course of treatment. Homeopathy is very specific in its approach. Now, when I look at, let's say, the way homeopathic medicine is treated by establishment outlets, so we'll talk about, let's say, the media, obviously the pharmaceutical industry, many politicians, regulators, it's not favorable. No. But there are two ways of looking at this. They will say it's not favorable because we're looking out for people's health and we can't have people relying on quacks and quack medicines when people have serious illnesses. And the homeopathic people look at it and say, well, of course, these vested interests are going to be opposed to it because their training, their incomes, their everything is invested in the existing system. And, you know, the old saying that it's very hard to change somebody's opinion when somebody's income relies on him not understanding sure. what you're telling. Right, right, right. Yes. So clearly we have all the right enemies. I think that's good news. If we look at, I know I'm preaching the choir to say we can look at the last three years to see any vestige of trust in the pharmaco, medico, industrial complex falling away. The people that are most vocal about what is quackery and fraudulent medicine seem to be also the people and institutions that are out in the forefront trying to force people to take dangerous and untested drugs or you know, taking away their livelihoods and being thieves of joy in general. So to me, it seems pretty transparent. The American Medical Association was founded three or four years after the original Association of Homeopathic Physicians in the U.S., and it was founded partly in response to the presence of the homeopaths because they were taking American medical system by storm. And when Rockefeller funded the Flexner Report in, I think it was 1917 or 1912, somewhere in there, which was an attempt to discredit as many of the alternative medical approaches as possible in order to protect his interests homeopathy was squarely in the crosshairs and it has certainly been that way ever since. And I don't see a lot of reason to have confidence and trust in people who have lied so profoundly. But at the same time, the onus is also on people in my profession to demonstrate efficacy and healing. And I have seen that. I have seen it powerfully in testimonials, but it's also available clinically and in parts of the world where people can't afford to necessarily spend the kind of money that Americans spend on medicine. They use homeopathy more because it's inexpensive. And in India, in the hospitals, often they will even use homeopathy as a primary form of treatment for diseases such as cancer and have success doing that. And I have studied with some of those homeopaths. I have studied with homeopaths who are working effectively with people with HIV and severe symptoms in Africa, in places where resources are constrained and people turn to these alternatives, they discover that they work and the pharmaceutical companies don't have as much of an interest in shutting them down in those places because they're not making money there. Is there any overlap at all between homeopathic medicine and allopathic medicine. I mean, obviously, if I break my arm, probably you're going to recommend uh -huh. the same kind of treatment of it that I would get at a hospital. But sure. if I have appendicitis, is there, in principle, a homeopathic surgeon who would say you should have your appendix out? So originally, the homeopathic physicians in this country were physicians, and there are still physicians who are also fully practicing homeopaths. Absolutely. If a mechanical intervention is called for, we would advocate it. And in fact, where homeopathic physicians work with cancer, they will often advocate for what they call a debulking surgery to remove a tumor. And the other part of it is to remember that when we're dealing with whatever level of vitality is in the individual person, that is the thing that is being brought online to heal. And sometimes the problem that needs to be solved is so big. For instance, what I was confronting when I was diagnosed with leukemia. Sometimes the problem that is confronted is so big 
that no matter what tools you give that vital power, it can't overcome the problem. And it is necessary to suppress some or all of the problem for a time in order to buy the body, to buy the immune system time to bring more juice. So it's very much the case that homeopathy and conventional allopathy can be complementary. And I do work with people that are in conventional care, and I will support them either through side effects for serious conventional care or in recovery after conventional care or alongside. And as they're trying to get off a medication, they might work with me and their physician to use homeopathy to support the taper of a medication. So there are lots of times when you know, I have tremendous respect for the medical profession honorably practiced. And there are a lot of times where I would say, this isn't my bailiwick. You need this other kind of support. And I can support you in that process. Was homeopathic medicine your pathway to what we sort of clumsily call the liberty movement, or was it entirely coincidental? I grew up with Mises on the bookshelf. I have some OG cred. <laughs> so my path was securitous. I grew up with a libertarian bias in my life. And then I did not really think that there were very many other people out there because I certainly didn't know them. But I knew they were online and I studied economics, but was just appalled by what I saw in the finance world. And so I left finance and I kind of wandered around in horticulture and but always with this underlying passion and principle for Austrian economics and the basic principles of individual liberty. And then when I found homeopathy through my healing journey, not having anything to do with these other aspects of my interest, I was astounded at how intellectually and principally consistent it was in so many ways with those other viewpoints because it's individualized. It's considering a dynamic system and looking at how do we enable a dynamic system to operate and dynamic balance at an optimal level rather than just plugging holes and putting on band-aids and cutting things off. And I love the fact that it is internally credentialed rather than externally licensed and that homeopaths don't take insurance in this country. So I like that aspect of it. And there just is something anarchic about it because we have all the right enemies, everybody from Google to Fauci to the FDA, all the right kind of people hate us. So it was really very much the other way, but I have found so much overlap and sympathy in these various interests of mine. And I love being at the overlap in the Venn diagram at this time. What's your website and what would be the next, let's say, the action item you would like a curious person to take? Yeah. So my website is, and everybody should check the show notes if you don't know how to spell this, but it is www.innerc, so that's I-N-N-E-R-S-E-A, homeopathy, H-O-M-E-O-P-A-T-H-Y.com, innerchomeopathy.com. And on my website, in several places, pops right up, there's a button where you can schedule a free call. That's a full 30 minutes with me. There's no obligation. There doesn't have to ever be anything after that call. But we can talk about what's going on. What might you like homeopathy to help you with? What is homeopathy? What do I do? And I work completely remotely, so I actually do have clients all over the world, and I really encourage people to schedule that call, even if you just have questions, even if you're just curious. You don't have to know that you want a homeopath in order to schedule that call. It's totally free, and you will walk away with some insights and understanding. All right, so I'll have the website at tomwoods.com slash 2319. Well, thank you, Sarah, for answering some questions and helping me and a few other people who listen to understand this a bit better. And I hope people will check out innercehomeopathy.com. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. 
Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.